Uh, the first question came in saying, asking if it's possible to add some stainless steel to a watch case. Um, a lot of times, you know, a little bit of wear and tear, uh, wears things down, and it's necessary to build up an edge again. Or a lot of times the pins that, uh, you know, hold the watch band onto the face, those can wear off. Uh, personally fixed, uh, like, like, the, like Alan in here wrote, uh, fixing Rolexes. I've, I've been at shows where somebody walks by and says, hey, can you build up this edge or fill in this hole? Um, and yeah, you can take a little bit of wire and you stick that wire where you want it to go and then you hit it on the end. And that will deposit a little bit of the wire onto the location where you made the weld. And that's how you're able to build up an edge or fill in a hole. Um, on, the, on one watch that I did, it was uh, the pinhole that keeps the band onto the watch um, that, had, that had worn out. And so I filled in the hole completely and then he was a jeweler. So he went and, and re-drilled the hole. So it is very possible to do. It is a very easy thing to do. And, you know, when facing the, uh, when compared to the alternative technology, um, yeah, it's a little bit trickier to do it without uh, one of uh, either the laser welder or the pulse arc welder. Um, so that is a definite yes. You can definitely do stainless steel as a very easy metal to weld and filling in or building up a, a, an edge or filling in a hole or adding some structure is a very easy application that can be done. Um, I, I'll get back to it. I think that'll be one of the things that I'll try to do uh, after the presentation. And I can show you how you would go about doing that and give you some examples. Um, but rather than try to switch back and forth in the video, um, I'm just going to do it. Uh, at the end and transition everything away from one screen to the other uh, just so we don't have uh, hiccups and, and downtime as we switch back and forth. Um, if that's okay, then I'll move to the next one. Uh, or Peter, jump in if there's something. Um, yeah, the, sure second question, the second question came in of asking about electrode sharpening. Is there a better way to sharpen electrodes? Mine split often, and I find that it's very easy to splatter metal or contaminate the electrode. Is there ways to avoid... Let me see if I can move this. Is there a way to avoid the splatter where the weld metal sticks to the electrode? Um, if, you're, if your electrodes are, are, uh, are uh, splitting, we did actually have a bad batch of electrodes that came in from our supplier, and those were really prone to split, and they would split the entire length of the shaft. So if that's the problem that you're seeing, uh, if Jason's on the line or not. Um, if you see that your electrodes are splitting all the way down the shaft, that's just a bad batch. Uh, they, they contacted us, said they had a bad batch, and they replaced them all. But we didn't catch every one before it shipped out. So my, the, answer, the, the first answer to your question is, I'm gonna sh I'll ship out some new electrodes for anybody that says they're splitting. Um, just because that's not how they're supposed to be, and you will get much better results just by using the new version that are guaranteed, and, and uh, you know they 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 they're not a bad batch, I guess I should say. So uh, contact your local office, and then we can coordinate getting you new new electrodes, and that'll be on us. So don't worry about that. Um, when sharpening, if I can then move on from that, when you do sharpen, there are some tricks on sharpening the electrode. Um, I have two links that I'll open up and show, although then maybe I can just do it quickly here. Um, so there's an important aspect when you sharpen the electrodes, and that is the placement on the disc. If you can look at the, pic at the two pictures in the middle of the screen, um, the electrode here, what's most important is that the grit of the diamond disc that you're using to sharpen the electrode, you want that spinning in the same direction as the electrode shaft is pointing. The, the picture on the left, you can see the disc is going to be spinning, and we have the, the grit going the same direction as the shaft. On the picture on the right, you can see that the grit or the spin of the disc would be cutting perpendicular to the shaft, and that is not going to be good for your welds. It's, it's not going to hurt the electrode, but what it is going to hurt is the cleanliness and the shape of the electrode. Looking at the new picture, the top one is, is ground correctly and the bottom one is ground incorrectly. And you can even see the little lines and, and, uh, and cuts that go against the, the shaft, perpendicular to the shaft. What that's going to do is cause the arc to wander and it's going to give you inconsistent welds. So 
uh, that's why it's important that we uh, the the placement on the disc is imp is important when you're making your grinding. Um, also, here we kind of have this. We like to say that you use a maybe like a 15 degree angle, um, but you can change that as I'll show you in the next one. But this is kind of the recommended shape of an electrode. The taper we say is approximately two and a half times the diameter, so a one millimeter uh, diameter electrode. We say use a two and a half millimeters of of, uh, of taper to it. The next page of this document does show, though, some other contrary aspects of it. These are all different angles you can use when grinding your electrode. And you can see kind of the resulting effect that, that will have on the metal and on the, the weld shape and penetration. So there's something to look at. Um, and this document I'm referencing, uh, I can send that out. It's, uh, we have a, a, an electronic copy. Anybody can access it at any time from our website. But it has a lot of welding tips and tricks. And it's a good go-to resource for anybody that's, that's doing welding. So I think I'll refer to it again one other time in the, uh, in the presentation. So Dave, just to interrupt there, uh, we'll end up with this video on our website and we, okay. can, in we can include the document uh, with the perfect. video, so it'll be on the same page. Perfect, perfect. So um, these two, yeah, this is everything I said. You know, want this? You want the disc going in the same direction as the electrode shaft. I recommend sharpening all of your electrodes at once. Um, some people, when they need to reclean or resharpen their electrode, they'll take they're making welds, making welds, <laughs> making welds. Then they stop and grind that one electrode and put it back in, and then continue making welds. Well, what you don't realize is that's a big interruption to your process. So what I say is have a clean pile and a dirty pile of electrodes and sharpen them all at once. Put them in a box. Once you sharpen them, put them in a, in a clean pile. Um, when you use one, then you put it in the dirty pile and just grab a clean one. That way you're not interrupting the, the flow of what you're doing. You can focus on welding, and then when you need to, you stop and you focus on the ungrinding. And then needles can be sharpened on both ends. So that just doubles the amount of clean points you have when welding. Um, these two video links talk about the things I showed you in the workbook. The top one is, is a video of us grinding an, an electrode, and the bottom one is uh, a video of the different shapes and the effects that those have. So we've covered those already. We had a question about porosity, um, asking about, you know, you get obvious porosity when you are adding and building up metal. If you see porosity when you're adding material, what I would say is I just take a break uh, I take away the adding wire that I'm adding to it, and I just start welding on the metal that's already there. The, the welders, whether it's a pulse arc welder or a laser welder, you're able to push and move metal around based on the power setting and the angle that you're welding at. And so if I see that there's a hole or a pit inside of some added material that I've just deposited, I'll, I'll stop adding wire, and I'll just start welding on the metal that's already there and kind of get it to push and move and form how I want it to do. And then once you've filled in that hole, you just continue welding and adding more metal. Um, when there is a hole, I like to kind of use a, an analogy. When you're making welds, you're, you're creating molten liquid metal. And just like, just like water will fill to the bottom of a glass, the liquid metal does the same. If there's a hole, the, the metal will go down and fill that and push the air out. And so if there's a hole, just stick the needle in the hole and let it fill it back fill itself in with the melted metal um, and like I said at the bottom then once you filled the hole then you keep adding more metal and, and maybe you fill another hole and you add more metal until you get the result that you want so there's that one um, Scott was very helpful to this he asked us quite a few different questions these are all uh, as far as I could tell more related to laser welders, whereas the rest of the previous ones have been talking more of a pulse arc welder. Um, in a lower pool, um, can you do the same jobs? The biggest difference between the like a higher power and a lower power is just the, the amount of power you have available to you, and that's going to translate into spot size and, and more importantly, penetration into the weld. Um, just because you have more power available, you're going to melt more metal and you can achieve a deeper weld. And so that's what a higher powered one, a laser will give you over a, a lower powered one. Um, you won't really, you can always work around having a lower powered one and just do multiple. It might take you a little bit longer, but you can get the job done. 
Um, there's one, there's one thing I need to mention though, is that if you're comparing a 60 joule versus a hundred joule versus a 140 joule laser welder, um, that's one thing. We also have new, uh, now the recently launched Datto welder, and that one's only about a 10 joule system. And so it's, it's got quite a bit less power. And so that one might be the exceptions to some of these, but it, all the laser welders are very capable of making jewel repair type welds. And uh, it just, it's just, you got to learn the machine that you have and maximize it for the capabilities that it does have. The data, like I said, is a much smaller and it's a different design, but it's still capable of doing a lot of different jobs. And uh, like Peter said, maybe we can give a link to some of the recent data videos we've, we've produced so that um, you can, you can, uh, you can get a feel for what the data is and what the data isn't. Just to interrupt a second, I've just got a question from Marion. Uh, what weld pattern is ideal? What are we looking for? Not enough power versus too much power blasts a hole. For example, okay. looking for a soft dome. So perfect. In a laser, well, let me start with this. In a pulse arc welder, there, uh, there's a lot of, well, both in pulse arc and laser welding, there's a lot of different parameters that you can change and adjust. On the pulse arc side, we've tried really hard to tie them all to one parameter or one variable. As you increase the power, your spot size will get bigger and your penetration will go deeper. With the laser welders, it's a little bit more tricky to have them all be tied together in one function. And so the laser welder, what that'll let you do is you can increase the power and actually shrink the spot size. And that's gonna give you a very concentrated weld and I believe if you jump down here to the fourth bullet point, it says, what's the maximum weld penetration and depth of a single pass? That depends. I said, you can blow a hole in a one millimeter sheet by maximizing the power and time or say, or in other words, having the most available energy coming out and then shrinking the spot size. So if I have a spot size of 0.2 and a max power and max time, I'll punch a hole through a one millimeter sheet of steel. Um, so what you're going to want to try to do is find that sweet spot to where the power and the time and the spot size are all compatible with each other. Uh, maxing the power and shrinking the size isn't really ideal if you're trying to make welds. It's just going to drill holes. Uh, my go-to on a jewelry piece is I usually start at a, about a one to one and a half a kilowatts of power, one to two milliseconds of time, and a spot size of 0.8 to 1.0 millimeters. That's kind of my starting point in general. Now, if it's a bigger piece or a smaller piece, I'll start smaller, but kind of a rough starting point, that's what I would look for. And then if, let's say, 111 isn't enough power to make a weld, well, then you bump up either the power or the time or you shrink the spot size. But I only do one variable at a time because if you go try to change two or three, you've kind of lost your point of reference. So start with 111, for example, and then go to one and a half, one one. Um, and just change one variable until you kind of find the, the result that you're looking for. Uh, maybe we can see if that was a, an adequate response. Did that uh, answer the question? Pat, could you just respond to that, please, Marion? Marion, I've just unmuted you if you'd like to um, respond to oh, uh, yes, just um, we have the Orion Pulse uh, welder. So my okay. question was specifically about the pulse weld pattern. Um, but I appreciate we were talking about the laser welders at the time. Okay, no, that's perfect. That's fine. So you, you've got the answer for the lasers. Uh, the pulse, like I said in the beginning, it's kind of nice that everything's tied to that power bar slider. Um, and I just kind of slower a bigger weld or slide down for a small weld. You can those like, but even me, I've got a lot of years experience welding and I just stick with just changing the power up and down as needed. Um, and then to get a good strong weld, what I like to do is if I make one weld, let me see if I can draw a pen, if you can still see my screen. Um, let me get you a pen. If I make a weld and it comes out looking like a circle, what I'll do is I will take the, the needle and I'll put the needle right at the very edge, right here on the very edge of that previous weld. And what that's going to do is that's going to center the next weld on the very perimeter of that previous weld. And it's going to give you a perfect overlap. 
Now forgive me for my drawing capabilities. Um, that's fine. You do it again and you put the needle right at the very perimeter of that one and that's gonna center it right there. And you can see you've got maybe a 50% overlap here and a 50% overlap here. And if you continue that on, you're gonna get a nice weld bead that's uh, overlapping as it goes. That's for a seam weld, um, but it kind of applies to different welds as well. If you're adding material, let's say you have a wire and you wanna lay it down on, on something bigger, this top one being the wire. Um, the wire comes down, touches the, the outside of the ring. Same thing, I'd put the first weld right here and then I'd touch right at the edge of that previous weld and make the next weld right there. And Sorry, mate. The, the um, video right screen, there. the video screen's covering up the drawing at the moment. Okay. Oh, you can you can move that. Yeah. Um, click on the screen and drag it. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah. Just there you go. All right. Thanks. Thank you. That's better. Is that yeah? So I would just say when you're making welds, you want it to be strong. Just make sure you get a good overlap. Sometimes people will, let's say they have a post on an earring, for example, and there's the backing. You know, they put one weld here and then one weld here and one weld on the backside. That's not a problem. That's not a bad thing. But to do it right, you'd kind of want to go and make sure it's a constant seam all the way around doing the same overlapping pattern that, uh, <laughs> that I've very poorly drawn for you. And will that, that leaves a nice deep concave um, and then adding material over the top of that would, would it increase the strength? Yep, yep, exactly. So if this is two pieces now from the side, uh, you'll have a little bit of a divot like that. Well, let me, let, me, let me exaggerate it. You'll have a divot like that maybe in the weld seam. So this is piece one and this is piece two. Then if you come back in with a wire, you can fill in that hole and, uh, and build it up higher than you need. And then you come back through and just file this part down. Um, and then you've got a nice seam between, uh, between the two pieces. Is that helpful? Very that, good, uh, very good, yeah. Okay, super, super, very good. Thank um, you very and much. And that'll actually, that'll play into a, a question later on as well. So that'll help um, when we get to that future slide. Um, it will jump back in then, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so I think we, I think we're number two. Does it leave the metal in a brittle state and is there porosity? Porosity can happen depending on the alloy that you're welding. Um, a lot of alloys that have zinc are gonna be more prone to porosity. Um, gases sometimes if they have a high zinc content. The reason is zinc melts at a very low temperature relative to the rest of the metals that you're gonna deal with. So when you make a weld, zinc is actually evaporating and disappearing, leaving holes where the zinc was. Um, so that's the number one place where I see porosity. The other thing is porosity can occur in certain metals. Um, uh, titanium being, you, you, if you see a lot of porosity, I'm going to recommend you use argon gas. Now the Orion pulse arc welders, I'm going to recommend argon all the time. The litter, that's an, it's an optional Seeing a lot of our, a lot of porosity just in general with the pulse arc welder, I would say check your gas settings. Make sure your gas is good. You got a good flow. Um, a lot of times, any porosity you're seeing can be fixed by just having a better argon flow. Um, does the beam need to be perpendicular to the surface? Uh, the yes and no. I would say in general, you always want to have a perpendicular a perpendicular angle. Um, the reason for that is if you come into, if this is the, uh, the surface, and if you come in with a perpendicular Orion pulse arc needle or a laser beam that's coming straight down, that's going to give you the best results. If I, if I show you that from a top down, it's going to be a perfect circle. That's not a perfect circle. It's going to be a perfect circle, okay? <laughs> um, if I change the angle to be more of like a 45 degree, um, what it's going to be doing is the energy is going to be coming in at an angle and it's going to hit the surface and it's going to kind of bounce away. It's going to bounce uh, off. And that would actually give you a good, uh, this first circle that was not a circle is probably a better representation of what you would get as you change the angle. Um, it's going to be more elongated one way or the other based on how the angle of the electrode is coming in. And so in general, I'm going to say be as perpendicular as you can. Or if you're welding in uh, a joint in a corner let's say you're like this you've got piece one over here 
and piece two over here and you need them joined here in the middle, I'd come in as best you can it, so that you have a matching angle from this side to this side. Um, now there are some times where I would change that. If you have a very thick piece over here and you have a very uh, thin post over here, this is a time where you could cheat and use a system that's more at an angle like this. And I would put the needle, I'd put the Orion needle right here uh, at an angle like this. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna take a lot of material from over here and it's gonna throw it up onto the little piece. Because if you try to go, if you have a small piece here and a thick piece here, and you try to come straight in at, at a 90 degree, oftentimes you're gonna blow a hole in the small piece and it's not gonna weld. So you can cheat and use the extra substance of the larger metal and come out of that angle and throw it up and push it onto the smaller piece. And that's a way that you can achieve uh, a good strong weld when there's a big disparity between the thicknesses of the two pieces. Um, I hope that kind of came through okay uh, with my crude drawings and uh, lack of ability of actually showing you. Um, so, but to answer the question, I guess, um, let me move back. Um, does the, does it need to be perpendicular to surface? I would say in general, yes, but you can change the angle if you want to push, uh, the metal, uh, and achieve different unique welds. And that's going to be kind of something you're going to learn as you get it, as you play around with it. Um, this one we tackled, you can get deep penetration. If you, I would say the number one factor in penetration is going to be time, not energy. Uh, more penetration is going to be achieved by time. And it's basically, just think of it as you put something in the oven for longer, it's just going to bake it even more. When you're welding, if you have longer time, it's going to penetrate deeper and deeper. So maximum weld penetration, you want to have your time. Uh, you want to increase the time. The power will be important uh, to overcome the initial melting of the metal, but the time will be the penetration. Uh, estimate on running costs, maintenance costs uh, of a laser welder is how I answered this one. Uh, maintenance on the laser is very easy and very affordable. The flash bulb will last you 5 million welds, plus or minus, I mean, give or take. Uh, you can run it for, you know, 7 or 8 million um, if you needed. The price on it is 350. When do you need to change it? You'll know you need to change it when your power output just isn't the same as what it used to be. Uh, just like a battery in your car or your phone, it's going to degrade a little bit over time. And when you start realizing that your power output just isn't what it used to be, uh, your flash lamp's starting to kind of degrade a little bit. You can buy a new one for, uh, you know, 350, 400 bucks, 300, uh, 350, 400 US dollars. Um, and uh, it's an easy, you just got to be able to take, a, take out some screws and then you can replace that bulb on your own. The water, uh, you can drain it and replace it. Uh, you don't even have to. I've got a customer that hasn't ever done it after five, six years. Um, but if you want to just be up on top of it, you can replace the water. It's just deionized water, uh, and it's a quick, easy, like I said, 10-minute process. So the running cost on a, on a laser welder is not much. It's the flash lamp and the water. On an Orion, you need to use the argon gas. That's a consumable just based on use. The more you weld, the more argon you're going to use. And then the needles, that's your other consumable. Um, the more you... Uh, the more you grind it, the shorter the, the, the shorter the needles become. Once it's too short, you throw them away. And they are, um, you know, just a couple dollars each to replace. So one needle, I say, will give you five or 6,000 welds on your pulse arc welders. Five or 6,000 welds per needle, and they're, you know, three or four dollars for a, a new needle. Um, so not a lot of, on either machine, not a lot of operating uh, cost. Uh, most common fault and breakdown, again, this is laser focused. So I said the laser beam can go out of alignment and that's very easy to fix. There's two set screws that you are going to adjust and um, uh, you just uh, uh, adjust it. You'll adjust it one way on the X and Y, or sorry, one way on the X and one way on the Y and you zero it in. I've got a video and a document. Um, so it's a very easy thing. What can a laser do? I actually asked uh, co-workers help me with this one just to see just make sure I was covering it all uh, any metal um, oh, Dave we just on, just lost you the my, my, you get my, my phone charger uh, sorry are you there I'm a, am I am yep. I come back yeah yep 
If you could just repeat okay, that last Sorry. sentence. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. What can't a laser do? Um, I asked some help. I asked for some help on this one just to make sure I didn't uh, forget or omit anything. Um, so here's what my team gave me. It says a laser can weld any weldable metal. Some are harder than others. It cannot weld plastics or tie your shoes. I was going to get that out, but I thought, well, maybe we'll keep it. Um, you can weld any, any metal. It can be welded with the laser. There is a question of how well does the different particular metal weld. I can't guarantee that. And some combinations of metals just are not compatible, but you can do different metals together. Um, a common one that we run into in our industrial, um, in our industrial application is welding copper and aluminum. They're both very conductive, and so there's benefits to that. But the problem is I can make great welds, but there's no mechanical strength. Meaning if you, if you put too much uh, torque on the weld joint, it will pop very easily. Um, but the laser welders, they'll weld anything that's metal. Um, the other thing I wanted to make mention is what can it do? You can do anything, but it may not be um, always the best choice. Uh, meaning this, just cause you have a laser or just cause you have a pulse arc, it's, you're still going to want to hold on to your torch and solder. If you're doing a thick, thick men's ring that it doesn't have any reason not to solder it, I would still stay solder it because once that solder flows, uh, you're done. Versus if it's a thick, thick men's ring on a laser or a pulse arc, you're going to be sitting there welding, 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 welding. You're going to spend a lot more time welding than you do, uh, just hitting it with a torch. So it's really going to be dependent on the application that you have. The laser can do it, but it might not always be the best choice. Um, if the, I think I saw a question. Did a question pop in? Oh, Should okay. Handle that one? Yeah, so um, when you're talking about it, uh, some more info about re-tipping with a pulse arc. Okay. Let me maybe um, circle back to that one. I'll make note of sure. that. I'll circle back to that towards the end if that's all right. Yep. Um, I do have a section, I think, uh, with that one. So we, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not running from the question. We'll address it. Yep. Um, question: Do laser work well with 18 versus nine platinum versus silver? Still, uh, what's difficult? You can make welds on all. And um, like I said here, the more the more the metals I like to stay away from when possible just because there's zinc in both of those um, the pure metals really nicely silver is a little tricky within that group though due to it's very conductive and it's very shiny um, with uh, I guess we can address that when I'm doing a lot of silver work I'd actually prefer to do it on a pulse arc welder rather than a laser the laser welders tend to, the beam will tend to bounce off the surface of the, of the silver and not actually make a weld versus the pulse arc welders. They don't really care if it's shiny or dull. Uh, they just zap it and, and, and it, it's able to overcome the conductivity of the silver and make good welds. Not to say you can't do silver with the laser. You will want to up the power a little bit. And oftentimes you want to rough the surface. If you just, uh, some sand, and just broke the up there, Dave. Dark, uh, dark Sharpie marker. If okay. you can just repeat um, that last I was talking thing. about, is, is it better? Is it coming in? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So with the silver, if you're doing silver, I prefer it on a power. You'll increase the power for a gold or a steel piece. And the other trick is to rough up the surface. Um, some something just to kind of rough it up a little bit and or use a dark Sharpie marker to, uh, to take away the shine. Does it leave a bright finish? Is there a special place? There's uh, with that maybe straight with solder. There's no prep work. You can ring off and start. Okay, we're just losing you again. Uh, the nice thing too is in a camp. Okay. Um, I'll, uh, <laughs> how much did you hear there? How not, not much of that last couple of sentences, no. Um, let me see. Let me see one thing real quick. Let me see if there's a different connection I can use. I mean, you're fine now. <laughs> okay, okay, perfect. All right. Well
All right. 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 yeah, the app. I'm not sure what happened. The uh, the app on my phone quit. So, uh, if you're hearing me now, though, uh, uh, can you hear yeah. me? Okay, should I keep going? Yes, that's fine. Yep. Okay, sorry. I'm not sure. Not sure what's uh, what that one was. Um, I think we were. I think we finished the one. Moving on to the next one, the bright finish. Are there special preparation? Yeah, there's not a lot of preparation. There's not a lot of cleanup either. You'll need to file it down, uh, smooth it off, uh, some some sanding, some emery. That's really all it is. So in contrary to what like you do in, with a torch, there's no, there's no prep and there's, no, there's a lot less cleanup because we're not dealing with any, any, uh, any chemicals. We're not dealing with solder. It's just pure metal. Um, and that's nice. The, uh, the bright finish, it should match. The, if you're going to polish the ring after you've done the welds, the, the, the polish on the welded part should match the polish on the, the ring itself just because it's, it's uh, metal to metal. If you're doing an 18 ring, I'd do an eight. If, if you're doing 18 yellow on the ring, I'd use an 18 yellow wire. Um, or a silver ring, use a silver wire. And that way you get a color match when it comes time to polish and clean the joint. And uh, that gives you the best results. And the bright finish is just as bright as uh, any other polishing that you've done, whether or not it's on the welded joint or on the, on the, sh on the part of the. the does the leader work with a series of pulses or a continuous beam or both? The pulsar and pulse. He will Sorry, Dave. And we're just losing you again. Pulsar welders, depending on the. All right. Sorry, guys. I'm not sure what that could be, uh, be caused by. Uh, if it's. Is it back? Is it back? Is it. Uh, it is. You hear me again now? Yeah, perhaps it's uh, your pace of speech. I, I, that's all I can put it down to. Maybe just speak a little slower, and it seems to be okay then. All right, let me try. Let me. Uh, I will try that then. Um, all the welders, when they weld, it is pulse by pulse. Uh, the speed will vary based on the machine that you have. The bench top laser welders will do up to thirty welds per second the dado laser is one per one weld per second and on the Orion the pulse arcs you can get up to uh five welds per second depending on the model are there jigs to hold or is it by hand you guys can create any jig that works for your setup a lot of people will use a third hand you can set you can use a, an existing third hand um, on our engravers, you can, I can send us some video links. We have an X, Y table that will slide if you needed to do a perfect linear line or a linear bead that they're made, they, they're made more for the engraving work, but you can use them with the engraver or the welders as well. The rotary clamp, if you needed to do a seam weld on a rotary, let's say you had a, like a, like a tube where you wanted to weld two rings together, you could use the rotary clamp, I guess. Um, but usually most of what I do on, on the jewelry side is done by hand, but any jig that you have there or any jig that you can create can be integrated with the welder. Inert gas. Do we always use argon? What kind is used? We, on the laser welders, you do not need to use argon. However, the pulse arc welders, I would strongly recommend to always use argon. Although I've got a big client here in the U S that He's, he's bought many, many machines and does not use any argon ever. The problem is it's going to be more prone to porosity and require a lot more cleanup after welds. So you can kind of gauge that and, uh, you know, figure out how you want to do that. I would always use argon doing, when doing titanium. Uh, otherwise, it would be very porous and weak. Um, can you use the weld like engraver? I'm going to say no, you can make weld spots if you took the time to overlap them and create a design. You could, it's just going to be a weld spots, circular weld spots. So it's don't expect a giving output if you're using the weld. Gems, 
if you use a laser welder and you aim it at a gem, a, yes, you can damage the gem. Um, if you shoot your hand in the laser, it will put a hole in your hand or, or burn the skin. Um, and that's one of the problems with the laser welder. There's no say once on the pedal and say weld, wherever, whatever's in line of sight with that laser beam, it's going to get hit. Um, now, if you, can, if, you, uh, if you ask the next question there, is there an advantage for the pulse arc versus than the cost? Well, this kind of goes into the one I just answered. A pulse arc, you can't shoot or weld a gem with a pulse arc welder because the pulse arc welders only weld on metal. It's got to be conductive. So with that being the case, if I initiate a weld and the welding electrode is touching the gem and not the metal, the weld will abort automatically and will not make any weld. You can still damage a gem using the pulse arc welder if your weld is right up next to the gem and the power is too high. But hopefully people who are using either the laser or the pulse arc are just careful when they're doing gem work and they know to lower the power and do the best they can to keep the weld away from the gem. Um, and again, lower powers will be the biggest contributor to, to not, not damaging a stone. So there's always the likelihood of it, but low power is going to be the answer or the solution to that problem. Um, we had a question about tacking before soldering. That's a great use for, for these machines. Um, to tack before soldering, I like to start out really low powers. And because if you have a low power, you can always go up. If you start with too high of a power you, and you, make it, you damage the piece, you can't really go back and lower the power and, and try it again. So lower power and just slowly go up. So keep it at about one or two joules and, and get the tack that you want. You can increase it to three or four if you need, a, if you need more power for, based on the size of the piece. But just do a low power weld and you can, you can absolutely tack before soldering. Uh, what's nice about it, even if, if it's tacked, you can still even twist or bend the piece and get it exactly how you want it without having to do any jigging or wire binding or, or anything like that. Now, I also put a note here. The pulse arc welders have a tack mode, but I'm going to recommend you don't use tack mode to tack pieces. Tack mode, um, tack mode requires two variables. It's one, the power, and then two, the pressure or the contact between the surfaces of the pieces you're tacking and doing it by hand, there's no way to gauge and be repeatable with the pressure that you're putting between the two pieces. So I'm going to recommend that don't ever use the tack mode to tack pieces unless you have something that can give you a repeatable and controlled force between the two pieces. We do that more for our industrial customers who use a weld head where you set the pressure and then it makes a consistent weld that way. But for jewelers and, and for, I think, the majority of what people are looking to do, to tack pieces, just do a very low-powered arc weld. Adding metal. Um, can you add small amounts of metal? Yes, that's the big, huge benefit of using a pulse arc or a laser welder. Uh, like I mentioned previously, two slides ago, it's best to use the same metal as what you are welding on. So a gold ring, gold wire, silver ring, silver wire. Um, if you don't know what the metal is or the metal that you're, the wire that you're using doesn't really make a good bond. So actually the good bonding metal with all other metals. So when in doubt, you can always throw silver into the joint and it will help, um, help the two pieces, uh, have a stronger joint between them. Uh, last note, like it says here, do not use solder. Um, anytime you're welding with, uh, with the pulse arc welders, the solder is going to melt um, at a much lower temperature, and so it'll be very poppy, very very dark and dirty when you weld on a solder. So even when you're resizing a ring that's been soldered, it's best to get the solder first and then do the welding. Nick was having, he's got a machine, the welds break after he welds it. Um, I, it didn't say the material type on this one, but often I've seen that, oh, am I still sharing my screen? You are, uh, yep. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, I don't see what metal I've seen a lot of this cracking though, more on silver than anything else. Um, so there's a few suggestions there uh, that you can see the number one 
I would recommend is make sure, making sure you have good penetration. If you just have a surface weld, it's going to be more prone to cracking down the line down the, uh, later on. So an option to that is to do a V. So if you have, um, if you have a, a shank that's, oh, let me turn the pointer on. So if you've got a ring shank that comes around like this, and let's say it's a two or three millimeter thick, if you just make a weld, and here's your break, if you just make a weld on the surface, it's maybe going to penetrate that far. And so you can see on the bottom side, you do the other one. You've only got a weld that's maybe that deep. So instead of that, what I recommend is taking a file and filing a groove down, something like that, and then making a weld down inside that's going to penetrate deeper, something like that. And then taking in filler wire, but just a small little wire of the same material and laying the wire in there and filling that part in and doing it over and over. And, and then slowly you'll fill this back in. And that's how you can achieve deep penetration um, on, a, on a thick piece. So that's one question. Just um, losing you there, Doug. Second, I made a, okay. Yeah, let me give it a second, see if it catches up. Yep. I heard you fine, but I don't see, there we go. Okay, all right, so back to the bullet points. So doing a V cut to prep the joint is always a good idea. Um, I'll give you this link, there's a good video that shows that on our webpage. Um, the, Nick mentioned that he has a 200i. I'd also try to suggest maybe using triangle mode. Now triangle mode, is only available on the 200i. It's not available on the 150s or the 100c. But triangle mode has a unique ability to have a low power weld that, but sustain it for much longer than you can on the other machines. And that, like I said, time is the biggest contributor to penetration. So I would switch to a triangle mode if you're trying to get penetration. On the S welders or the C welders, you're, there is no triangle mode, so your only option is to do, like I said, on that drawing and do a V cut. Uh, make sure you're not using solder. Any solder that's in the joint will cause it to crack down uh, later on. Uh, agitation can help give you a tighter grain structure. So I would do a sloped agitation if, the, uh, if you're still seeing issues after you do the V. Um, that bottom one changing, the fourth one says changing the time. I would, I would extend it as much as you can. The other thing specific to silver, and that's what I wrote the next, the third to the last bullet point that says taper the heat. Um, if I have, what do I mean by taper the, the heat? I'll draw, I'll draw this again. If this is my ring, and this is the weld joint, and I've welded a big V, and everything in here has been welded, or even an X cut and you do it on the bottom side. Um, basically, everything from right here to right here has been very hot. You've been welding right here and it's very, very hot. But on a silver ring in particular, this portion right here will be very hot. But this portion right here, uh, right over here, is not going to be hot. And so what happens is you have a very cold part of the ring abruptly meeting a very hot part of the ring. And that can cause uh, some stress on the metal. So one thing I've found is very helpful is even though from right here to right here, this is where I made the weld, I will go ahead and lower, and let's say I had a power, let's say I was, I was at uh, 15 joules of energy. Um, what I would do is kind of feather the heat away so you don't have this very strong line, is I'd maybe do a series of welds on the surface. Just, just hit it like this on the surface using maybe a power of 10. And then do another section here, a uh, series of wells. And basically what I'm doing is just trying to heat up the metal. Um, do that at energy of five and do the same over here, 10 and five. Um, what you're trying to do is transition. So if I draw a scale, this is the heat, there's zero heat, then it slowly ramps up to where it's hot, then it slowly ramps down to where it's cold. Um, that's kind of a trick so that you, rather than going, rather than going and having it come cold and then immediately hot, 
and then immediately cold and then over. Um, this will cause stress well. Is the top one that's more of a bell curve will kind of transition and smooth the heat affected zone. So that's my recommendation to kind of avoid any heat cracking that you might be running into. Um, our good argon coverage is going to be important for uh, to avoid cracking and brittleness in the weld. Um, my question to Nick was if, it, if is it just on one ring or does it happen all the time? The ring might not be what you think it is. It might be it might have other zinc inside that uh, just not going to ever weld well, no matter what you do. If it's something you're happening a lot of, a lot of times, um, you know, maybe employing one or more of these, uh, these suggestions could help. And then Roger has uh, soot uh, after welding. He says even though he's got argon, uh, he gets uh, sooty welds after making um, welds. He gets dark soot on the surface. So argon will help eliminate oxidation inside the weld. But you can still get soot uh, around the weld, and that's most likely caused by contaminants and finger oils that are on the surface of the metal. So if you clean it really well before you weld, that can help with the soot. But if there is a soot, it's most likely just, like I said, contaminants and oils that are burning due to the high heat of the weld. And that soot should, in most cases, just wipe off real easily. So I wouldn't get too concerned that it's affecting the weld too much. Any, any oil that's in the actual weld itself is going to burn off completely. It's usually around the outside of the weld that you see the soot, and that's just from the residual heat from the weld. Um, so it's not an argon question. It's more of a metal surface cleanliness issue. And uh, Roger has a 150S. What's the best way to weld a heavy silver uh, joint? And so I kind of addressed that in the, in the slide above and, and a few pre before that. Um, the the V cut is a good idea. The time is a good idea. Um, just uh, just making sure it's clean. You've got good penetration. The time is good. The agitation, and then tapering the heat. Like I said, the other thing I've seen too um, is, and I don't know. I'm sure you guys can find this, but Bush makes a ram wheel. It's called it's Bush four five two S, or I'm sure there's other manufacturers of a similar wheel. And I've used some of these as well to kind of compact the weld as I go. And I've found that that can help with silver too. You're just, you're using it to beat the, uh, beat the metal down and compact a little bit more. If I give you a top view of what this piece looks like, uh, it looks kind of like, let me do it on a white screen. The top view of that piece looks like this. It's, it's missing notches as it goes around. and this is a horrible drawing, sorry. But what, uh, as this is spinning in your motor, um, these little edges kind of help compact the metal. So if this is your ring here and this is spinning around, um, it's going to knock any, uh, any, any high points down and just compact that down. So I found success using that in the past. Uh, that was a recommendation based off of a jeweler friend. So you could get this or whatever the, uh, the AJS equivalent is of that product. That could also help when, uh, when you're running into cracking issues or whenever you're doing very thick silver joints. Um, so that's kind of the, question, the answers to the questions that were, uh, were presented. And uh, Andrew from our Brisbane branch has just uh, put in the chat box the code for that uh, bush burr. Perfect. Perfect. So we've got that. Dave, you've done a fantastic job. Um, congratulations on addressing those questions and thank you to our participants for providing them. Uh, for your information, uh, we've recorded this uh, online educational and it'll be available on our website. So there's a couple of videos and documents Dave referred to through the session. So they'll also be available on the same page as that video. So uh, look out for those. We'll send you out an email to let you know about that. Now, if you do have any other follow-up questions from today or want any one-on-one -on -one, uh, service or attention, please just uh, contact your nearest AJS branch and we'll be only too happy to address any questions and get a, a solution for you. So um, thanks very much, Dave. Thanks to our participants. Um, and we will be running more of these. So uh, please stay tuned. So uh, not only with Orion, 
but with other suppliers as well. Now, just one quick one to end on, Dave. Uh, uh, Marion's got a question there, re-tipping Q. Yep. Oh, re-tipping question. That's right. Remember yep. that one? Yep. yep. So let me try to do this. I've got a ring and I've got a wire. Let me do one thing. I'm going to sh uh, sharpen an, an electrode. Um, I can show you that. So here's, a, here's the dirty electrode. Um, and like I said, this will cut this will cut against the grain. So I don't want to do that. I want to do it down here. I don't know if that is even in focus. So there, I've got a clean electrode for you. And now I'm going to try to position that camera well enough that I can show you the, the retipping process. Are you able to see the needle okay? Is that an okay angle and, and view? Yeah, we can see it, yeah. Okay. Um, so here I've got just a silver ring. It's just a very simple, basic one, four prongs on a, on a glass stone. I've got some silver wire that I'm going to use. Um, I'm using right now, I'm on the 200i, and I, my energy is set at four. Um, when I'm retipping, I like to, like I said earlier, you can damage the stone if your power is too high and you are too close to the stone. So what I like to do is I'll put the wire, and I don't know how much of this you're seeing, I'll put the wire onto the prong and I'll always put the needle on the opposite side of the prong from the stone. I don't like to weld where I'm touching the stone and the prong at the same time. I'll get on as much as I can when I make a weld. And then I start doing it there. Let me do one quick thing. Let me turn the power up a little bit. So then I'm able to add that wire on um, and then slowly build that up. Now, one thing you can do, you can snip that wire or you can actually, I'm going to pull on the wire and touch right down by the, by the wall. And you can pull that wire as it welds and it'll snap it off. And then as you go progressively, you can just keep adding and adding based on how much, how much Prong you need to build up. So you can see there, um, I don't know how well you can see, but maybe a side by side on those two, those two balls. It's a bit blurry, um, but um, we've got a good idea. And so um, if people do have something they want to see welded, uh, you could do a little video of that. Yeah. Yep. So if you have any suggestions for something you want to physically see, just pop it in the chat box and uh, we'll address that for you. Dave, thank you so much. We'll uh, call it quits there. You've done a great job and uh, we look forward to the next time. Super. Very good. Well, All thank right. you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks very much, Dave. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.